Turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 is the place that this church has been for a number of weeks now. As you're turning there, I want to take you to a bit different place for a purpose. The Gospels, you'll remember, give us the account of the transfiguration where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John on a high mountain, and it tells us that there before them he is transfigured. Matthew adds this, that in that time his face shone like the sun, and his garments were as white as light. Mark then adds this account that his garments became radiant, exceedingly white, as no launderer on earth could whiten them. And Luke adds those words, he showed us his glory. If that were not enough, then Moses and Elijah show up. And then the cloud overshadows them, and the voice comes from the cloud. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased, listen to him. If you read that account and you study that account and you revisit that moment there, there's a sense in which Peter, James, and John, they're not ready to leave and to go back to the day-to-day life that they were experiencing before that moment. They recognize the splendor of that place. They've never experienced anything like they're experiencing in that moment with what's going on around them in that place. That is a place you want to go to, that is a place you long for, and that is a place you don't want to leave. Genesis 2 takes us into a place. It takes us into a place that we long to stay, a place that's also displaying the splendor of a pristine creation and the glory of its creator, God. The splendor of the place that we're going to look at here in Genesis 2 is identifiable by what is there. A creation is there that's displaying this God's sovereignty and his providence and his glory and as we have already seen, his power and his wisdom and his goodness. But the splendor of this place is also identifiable by what you know is not there. There is no sin there. There's no death or pain or suffering or loss or heartache or destruction. Genesis 2 focuses on a specific place within this whole of the splendid creation, taking us into a garden crafted by God for man, a place that, as you know, because you've read, has inspired countless stories ever since this account was written. Stories where gardens are cultivated and food is plentiful and protection is provided, a place where innocence and goodness are prominent. These are places that resonate within the hearts of men. Authors know what they're doing when they write about places like that. Places where we long to be, places where, like we saw there, the transfiguration takes place, places where you want to stay and never leave. Genesis 2 takes you to such a place. Look in verse 4 of Genesis 2. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth. There was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man of dust, from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil." Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. The Bedlam and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It flows 
east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Verse 4 through 17 take what we've been looking at in Genesis 1 and concentrates on good, God's good design for man in creation. Those verses that we just read present a relational God, a living man, purposefully placed in a lavish garden and given God's word, revealing what's best for man so that he has everything necessary by the time you come to the end there of verse 17, everything necessary to cultivate life, satisfy his soul, and glorify his God. Verse 4 through 17 then is bringing us to life inside this garden. And the heart of man is made for what we find in Genesis 2. It longs for what you find in Genesis 2. In some way your heart is longing for this. Consider then four features here that are found in a pristine creation described in Genesis 2 verses 4 through 17 that lead to life, that satisfies your soul and that glorifies God. Four features that teach us what's best and what brings joy because this is what you were designed for. Feature number one is a relational God a relational God that's there in verse four through six. Now think about where we've been in Genesis one. The name translated God in Genesis one, you'll remember is the Hebrew word Elohim. It showed up over 30 times, Genesis one, one, in the beginning Elohim created the heavens and the earth, all the way to Genesis two, verse three, then Elohim blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which Elohim had created and made. That whole section there is about a him. Over and over, his name shows up. Those are the bookends, Genesis 1-1, Genesis 2-3, between which we're educated from Genesis about Elohim, who was the subject of every verb. He created, he moved, he said, he saw, he separated, he called. It taught us that Elohim has no beginning, Elohim has no end, Elohim is infinitely majestic in his power, glorious in his wisdom. He is Lord of creation, he's worthy of worship. It's right that we sing to him and praise him and acknowledge him. He's worthy. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 says this is the account. That's a Hebrew word, toledot, generations, translated in some places. It's almost a marker throughout the book of Genesis. Something's changing here. We're ending one thing. We're beginning a new thing. This is the account of the heavens and the earth where they were created in the day that the Lord God made heaven and earth. So in verse 4, the name is changed. From what we've become accustomed to, this is different than it was in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3. The name now is what we were reading a moment ago, Yahweh Elohim. Yahweh Elohim. Why would you change that here? Why would you change that in verse 4? In the chapters and the verses and the books that are going to follow this Genesis account, verse 4 here, chapter 2, the name Elohim is going to become prominent. It's going to show up again and again. This is the name that's going to come, you remember, to the forefront in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, when Moses says there to God, behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now, now, God, they may say to me, what is his name? Who has sent me to you? And this is the response. What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. That name I am, if you'll look there in Genesis chapter 2 verse 5, is from the Hebrew verb that's found right there. Now no shrub of the field was, that's the verb, was yet in the earth. The verb can be translated was or am or will be. This is the personal name, think about that, Genesis or Exodus 3, this is the personal name God gives Moses to give to his people that he's going to rescue. The name translated in your Bible so often, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, throughout your Bible, it's the name Elohim, or it's the name Yahweh. 
It's the name Yahweh that you have here. And that's indicating something. This name is relational, and it's intimate. He gives it to the man that he is tasked with taking his people out of their bondage to slavery. This is how they're to identify him. It's often the name that those who are closest to him call him. It is a name meant to remind you who he was, who he is, who he always will be. It comes up there in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, where he identifies himself as compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives inequity, transgression, and sin, yet will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Exodus 34, 6. Do you remember what comes before that? The Lord, the Lord God, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim. This is who he is. Why does Yahweh now show up in Genesis 2, 4 beside Elohim? Because Genesis 2 is wanting you to know something. Genesis 2 wants you to know that Yahweh that's going to show up throughout scriptures is the creator of the universe. That the God who is all-powerful creating everything from nothing in Genesis chapter 1, Elohim, is the God who is personal and relational, Genesis 2, Yahweh. As one Hebrew scholar noted, the reason why the two are combined in the Eden narrative is to bring together the title of the majestic, powerful God, Elohim, portrayed in Genesis 1, with the title of the personal, intimate name of God, Yahweh, in Genesis 2 through 3. The idea is that the transcendent God of Genesis 1 is the same as the imminent God of Genesis 2 and 3. He is over all things and powerful over all things and providential over all things, and he is right beside his people caring for them. By the way, when Satan slithers into the garden here in a few weeks in Genesis chapter 3, you will note he doesn't use the name Yahweh Elohim when speaking with the woman because he doesn't want her to know that Yahweh is there. Genesis 2.4 introduces you to Yahweh Elohim who made the heavens and the earth, but he did not stop there. This personal and relational God is intentional and purposeful in everything that's going to be transpiring here in Genesis chapter 2. Look at verse 5. Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God, there it is again, he had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. Now, there are some that will try to sow doubt into your mind whenever you read this in Genesis chapter 2 and say, look at verse 5 there, and they're going to say, what's going on? Is this a second account of God creating the plants within creation? Did he not do that in Genesis chapter 1? Where does that actually take place? They would argue the same with him forming man in verse 7. I've heard this argument. You may have heard this argument as well. Friend, you, you can see, I think, here from the text, it's really clear Genesis 2 is revisiting Genesis 1, and Genesis 2 is bringing into focus a different aspect here, the Creator's relationship with man and His plan for man in this garden. Look at those words, no shrub of the field, no plant of the field had yet sprouted. Verse 5 could be describing a time related to the formation of the dry ground that we looked at in Genesis 1, verses 9 through 10 there on the third day, a time before the earth had sprouted vegetations and plants yielding seed and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind, Genesis 1, 11. Or it could be cluing us towards something else about Yahweh. Note verse 5 describes what was not there. No shrub, no plant, no rain, no man. The word shrub of the field. Shrub in verse 5 is the Hebrew word sayak. It was not one of the words that was used in Genesis chapter 1 about the vegetation that sprouted forth from the ground. When it's used again, this word is in Genesis 21, 15, and it's describing the shrub, the bush, which Hagar left her son Ishmael under that was out in the wilderness of Beersheba. This is a shrub of the wilderness. That means something. Genesis 2, 5, there are no shrubs yet like this on the earth, a shrub that you could hide under. Why would you be hiding in Genesis chapter 2? 
a shrub that would provide you some sort of protection. Why would you need protection in Genesis 2? What would you need to seek protection from? The word plant there in verse 5 is the Hebrew word aseb, which does show up in Genesis 1, 11, 12, 29, and 30, but this time would you note there that it's plants yielding seed in Genesis 1, green plants for food, while in Genesis 2, 5, it's plants of the field. The next time plants of the field shows up is Genesis 3, 18, along with thorns and thistles growing and man eating the plants of the field by the sweat of his face, all that being associated with what? Sin, the curse and the effects of the curse. Genesis 1 seems to be describing a different plant, a plant that man could eat that didn't require the sweat of his face and wasn't related to the curse in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis 2, 5, there, the plant of the field says it had not sprouted. Why should it? When it seems there are already numerous other plants that he could eat from. Genesis 2, 5, the Lord had yet to send rain, which he will send in amounts that will flood the earth later in Genesis 7 in the form of judgment. We sang just a moment ago about rain and judgment. Did you notice that? The song that Grant led us in. But rain here doesn't seem to be necessary yet, because why? Of the environment. What's in verse 6? A mist used to rise, water the whole surface of the earth. And we'll see in a moment that this garden had abundant water. In Genesis 2.5, there's no man to cultivate the ground, to work the ground, which may anticipate, again, his caring for the plants of the field that's going to come in Genesis 3. So what's missing in Genesis 2.4 may be missing because it's related to sin and judgment. Man will attempt to hide and protect himself. Man will need plants of the field to labor over in order to consume when he's expelled from the garden, but not yet. So why would they be there? But they're in place, and they've not yet sprouted. Verse 5 is telling us what is not yet there as verse 5 is leading us into the garden. So in a sense, would you see what's going on? Yahweh Elohim has already planted seeds for what is going to reveal his glory. Yahweh Elohim has already planted the seeds for what is going to reveal His glory. What's going to sprout from the ground eventually is going to show that Yahweh Elohim is righteous and just, and that when He judges sin, He's right in doing that. And this is a way that His glory has yet to be seen in such a way. What what is missing in creation in verse 5 is going to show up And when it does, it will reveal a truth about Yahweh so that his people will know more about him. That same truth that is going to be expressed there that we read a moment ago in Exodus 34, he will not leave the guilty unpunished. He is a just God. He is a righteous God. They will know this about him. But in Genesis 2, there are none guilty. The pristine nature of creation in Genesis 2 is found in what's missing in verse 5, but also who's there a personal God, Yahweh Elohim, who made the earth and the heaven. Feature number two is a living man. Feature number two leads, has an understanding of this, leads to life, satisfies your soul, glorifies God. Number two, a living man in verse seven. Verse seven is revisiting Genesis chapter one in the work of the master craftsman in that climactic act of creation there at the end of day six, verse seven says, then the Lord God, there's the two names again, formed man of dust from the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So what's going on here? Yahweh Elohim formed man. That's the same word that's used to describe the work of a potter in Isaiah 29 and Jeremiah 18, or of God forming Israel in Isaiah 27 and Isaiah 45, or of him shaping servants of the Lord in Isaiah 49 and Jeremiah 1, or of God fashioning the natural world in Isaiah 45. Psalm 95, verse 5, you hear this same word, The sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hand formed the dry land. And would you know what verse 7 is telling you? In relation to that, from this dry land, Yahweh Elohim formed, fashioned, shaped man from the dust of the ground. 
If there is anything that might correct your sinful tendency to replace God with you or with any other man, you ought to know from here that every man is, originates from the dust of the ground. That's where you come from. Your flesh is from. And friend, as we'll see, that's where it's going. This is him who is fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalm 139, verse 15, or 14, him who is fearfully and wonderfully made is made from dirt. It's a testament, is it not, to the power of this God that he can do that. Only God can do this. Only God can form lifeless dirt into him who would bear his image. Christian, Genesis 1 and 2 then ought to serve as boundaries. It ought to serve as limits within our mind for where our sinful hearts are tempted to go. Image bearers, as we've been talking about the last few weeks, have dignity and worth that sets you apart from all the rest of creation. But then being formed from dirt, you need to be reminded you're not God. God is not formed from dirt. God is not formed. He's the one who creates. He's the potter. You're the clay. The sooner that's clear in your heart, well, the sooner that's clear in your heart and settled in your mind, the sooner you're going to be relieved of the burden of the frustration where you think you are God and you're disappointed and you think other people are God, and you're disappointed in them. Yahweh Elohim, note the text, formed man of dust. Yahweh Elohim breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. This is, again, personal. This is, again, relational. Job 33 verse 4 says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. The Lord God breathed here into his nostrils the breath of life. The picture is like that of you blowing on coals in order to fan them into flame, that the oxygen that's coming from you is having an impact, and you're actually seeing a fire that's coming up here. This is the living God breathing life into a man and flaming into fire life. Is it effective? Look at verse 7. And man became a living being. The living God effectively imparted life into the man. Throughout the Old Testament, later after Genesis 2, that word for being there is going to be translated soul. God breathing life into the man makes him a living soul. He possesses physical life. He possesses spiritual life. Later biblical writers are going to pick up on this. Isaiah 42 verse 5 says, He is the God who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. This is where breath and spirit and life come from is from him. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 1 says, He is the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. So verse 7 ought to settle in your mind a biblical view of man and why you're different than other creatures in this world. Genesis doesn't revisit God creating your favorite animal. It recounts in every, ever greater detail his creating man, his forming man, his breathing life into man, and man becoming a living being all from dirt, the dust of the ground. There's significance in that we'll think about later. But friend, from what you have here in verse 7, could we not rehearse what we find here back to God, praising and glorifying Him while correcting our thinking about ourselves and others and all of this impacting our biblical understanding of who man is? Could we not confess to God, thank you, Father, for fearfully and wonderfully making me and my family and my friends and, wait for it, even my enemies my life, their life, bears your image, attests to your goodness and power, because you can cause dust to be formed into a body. My life witnesses your might and your ability to make that which was dust to possess life. Out of what was most common and what is most ordinary, particularly in West Texas, right, dust, into a living soul, 
to confess to him, I thank you because I see a world filled with living men. I'm reminded that you are the God who imparts life, the personal God whose relationship with man is evident in how you made man. For I know, as the psalmist says, Psalm 135, 5, you are great. In Psalm 139, verse 14, I will give you thanks. Why? I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Friend, it ought to be It ought to be a soul-satisfying joy to you that he can turn dust into man and give you life. It ought to be a soul-satisfying joy to you because one day, apart from Christ coming back, you're going to be dust. The physical body that you have is going to be dust. Yahweh Elohim can make dust into a man. He can give a man life. And you think about the impact of that as a Christian, what he promises and what you see in the New Testament as it regards resurrection and glorification. There are glimmers of that here. What's going on? What's going on in Genesis 2? On the way to the garden, Genesis 2 is giving you a truth that's going to be essential for all that's going to come after it. Yahweh Elohim can form man from dust and give him life. Feature number three, a lavish garden. Verses 8 through 14 a lavish garden. Those verses describe a specific place. Not a myth, not an allegory, a place within creation that this relational God designed and purposed for this living man. Verse 8, the Lord God, there's the name again, planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Note, it is divinely prepared, it's divinely purposed. Yahweh Elohim planted the garden, he placed the man in the garden. The location is there, specific, toward the east in Eden. Eden is a Hebrew word, comes from a Hebrew word that can mean delight. This seems to be that Eden is a geographical region. It's not just a garden in and of itself, but it is this area on whose east end is this garden. And by verse 8... Man is in this garden, and the verses that follow tell us about this bountiful place. This is a lavish garden. Look at verse 9. Out of the ground, the Lord God, there's the name again, caused to grow every tree that's pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Would you just note how the garden's described from all that? It's divinely constructed in verse 8. God planted the garden. It's divinely productive in verse 9. God caused the garden to grow. It's wonderfully diverse in verse 9. Every tree pleasing to the sight. It's exquisitely beautiful in verse 9. Pleasing to the sight. It's incredibly edible, fruitful, nourishing, Verse 9, it's good for food. And here you also see it's flawlessly presented. Flawlessly presented. The divine landscaper is purposeful where he placed each element. Look at verse 9. The tree of life is in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Two trees. Tree of life, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I hope you would appreciate with me the note I read from a number of commentators who said this, quote, before we speak of the tree, it is sobering to recall that speculation about the tree was Eve's error. What can we say about the tree from Scripture, from Genesis? Well, one, there's a tree of life. So life is associated with this tree that's located here in the heart of the garden, according to verse 9, in the midst of the garden. Later, that tree is going to show up again, and it's going to cause God to express concern in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, after the fall, that man might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So immortality seems to be associated with this tree, yet he's purposefully placed it here in the midst of the garden. That's the tree of life. There's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
the location of this tree here is not specifically mentioned, but in Genesis 3.3, Eve seems to indicate it's also located in the middle of the garden. And if the first tree is associated with life and the consequence of eating it is living forever, Genesis 3.22, then this tree is associated with knowledge, knowing what was not yet fully known. And that knowledge coming from what's evil, doing what God said not to do, and having then a knowledge of good and evil, and the consequence of eating from it is going to come up in Genesis 2, verse 17. It's going to be death. It would seem then that the man who's placed in the garden with these trees here is placed there. He's only aware of what's good. He doesn't have any knowledge of evil in this pristine creation that's around him. Friend, what I want you to grasp as you see all of this being described here in Genesis 2 is that it's good that both trees are here. It's not an accident. God didn't make a landscaping error. God didn't make a mistake. They are presented as being in a central location in the heart of the garden. So this garden is described as divinely constructed, divinely productive, wonderfully diverse, exquisitely beautiful, incredibly edible, flawlessly presented where everything is located, one more marvelously opulent it is luxurious. There's a wealth of riches in this place that you see there in verse 10. The garden has abundant resources starting with water. Again, we might not know what that's like. Verse 10, now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. So there is this source of water that's flowing into the garden, and it's so great and abundant, we're told it feeds four rivers, divides into four rivers. Verse 11, the name of the first this Pishon, it flows around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. The gold of the land is good. The Bedlam, the onyx stone are there. The name of the second is Gihon. It flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Two of those rivers you can find on a map today. The first and most prominent and the second, people speculate where it's at. We don't really know. As you might have guessed, a lot of people take verse 10 and 14 and they're obsessed with the details there going, where is the garden? I'm going to find the garden. That's not what the verses are trying to communicate. Everybody who has done that's proven unsuccessful. Instead, what I hope that you see in those verses is that they show us an area called Eden that was surrounded with an abundance of water to nourish the garden, to make it fertile, and also surrounded by an abundance of precious stones and minerals that just added all the more to its extravagant beauty. What is critical to see here is not where can I go find the garden and, and what are those stones and, and what are all those different elements. What's critical to see is God's fingerprints are all over the garden. It's beautiful and luxurious and magnificent, so much so that one might call it paradise. This is a place you want to go. This is a place you want to stay, never to leave. What I want you to grasp is the reality of such a place. This isn't a story that Lewis wrote or Tolkien wrote or Bunyan wrote. This is a real place where sin and its consequences are absent. Nothing is broken here. Nothing is sick. Adam didn't look around the garden and go, why is that plant dying there? Or why did this bird fall out of the air? Or why did this creature fall over dead? The man who occupies the garden is not sick. There's no death, no suffering, no pain, nothing to fear. There is nothing lacking. It's lavish and abundant. Part of the splendor of the garden is notice, notable by what we know is missing, but more than that, Part of the splendor of the garden is by what God has done here. Fertile soil, abundant water, plentiful food, beauty in every direction. Not only would you want to be there, you don't want to leave. What's God's purpose for such a place? Look at verse 15. Then the Lord God, there's the name again, took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. The man was made for this place. He was made to do what he's doing here. We saw that all the way back on day six. The image bearer is placed here to fulfill this task of reflecting that he is a representative of God in this place, to cultivate and to keep. That's not a result of sin. 
This is a God-given assignment in a perfect garden where the ground isn't cursed, thorns and thistles, they're absent. You've never been to a place like this. You've never cultivated ground in a place like this. And it's real. Christian, this is not a fictional account. This is not a myth. This is not an allegory. This is not a tall tale. This is a real place. And it's created by a real God for a real man where man was made to live and enjoy his God. Even the psalmist who who is surrounded by a creation that has groaning after sin has come into the world can say in that psalm we become very familiar with, Psalm 104, bless the Lord, O my soul, O my God, you are very great. Let the glory of the Lord endure forever. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. Bless the Lord, O my soul. That's from a fallen creation. What would you say if you were in this place? It's very different in Genesis 2. Friend, just because you've never stepped into this garden like Adam did, In Genesis 2, just because you never experienced such a place, that doesn't mean it didn't exist. There are lots of places that you've heard about that you've not been to that I bet you don't think they don't exist just because you've never been there. It is essential to believe that there is a garden that is created by God for man that Yahweh Elohim planted, as the text says, that he caused it to grow, that he made it beautiful, that he made it good for food, that he placed the two trees there, that he placed the man there to cultivate and keep it, not as punishment, but to fulfill the purpose for which he made the man. You, You look at all this and you go, what could possibly be needed? Everything is there. One more feature. Number four, a good command. Something else is needed. And it's there in verse 16 and 17. To this point, Genesis 2, we've not been told of God saying anything until now. Verse 16, the Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely. Pause for a moment and think about that. Do you hear God giving man generous permission in that command? This garden is filled with every tree that's pleasing to the sight, good for food, and man is told, you may eat freely. Go for it. In Hebrew, the literal reading is eating you may eat, which is a way to intensify what is being said. Adam, all that you see before you in this beautiful place where you are to dwell with your God, you are free to eat. There is a buffet in the trees, and you just go get it, right? God is gracious. He's provided for you. He's generous. He's merciful. This is a good command. But as one commentator notes, freedom has no meaning without prohibition. The boundary for Adam is one tree. Verse 17, but from the tree, it's a singular noun. From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Friend, That's a good command. Verse 16 emphasized freedom, saying, eat, eating you may eat. Verse 17 emphasizes the consequences of eating from this one tree by literally saying, dying you shall die. The thought that came to my mind this week as I'm thinking about that text is as Adam is hearing that, in his mind is he hearing that command and he's going, okay, What's death? I look all around me, I don't see anything dying. What are you talking about? I wonder if you and I have a far greater understanding of resurrection and glorification because we see that with Jesus than Adam has of death. Where is that in his understanding? But friend, consider it. He's not understanding death. That's no excuse. Instead, what is this? This is a way in which he's to trust and obey his God. I don't know what death is, but I I know he's telling me not to eat that tree. This command is spoken here by God in a pristine creation, and it may cause you to pause and ask, why is it good and right that the Lord God 
made this tree and put it in a central location in this place where he also put man to live. I think he did this because it would be a means by which man would know that he is a good God. And that this would be a way in which the man might worship his God and love him. God's goodness and mercy is on display with where he has placed the tree. God's goodness and mercy is on display telling the man where the tree is and telling the man what the consequences of eating from this tree, what those consequences are. Man is learning here then as he has been put in this place that God alone knows what is good for him. God alone knows what's best for him. God alone knows what's not good for him. And man is learning, I must trust this God who created me from dust and who has put me here. God knows what's good for me. God knows what's not good for me. I must trust the God who has put me here. I think the words of Moses that come in Deuteronomy 30 verse 15, they apply just as much to Genesis 2 here as they apply to the context of Deuteronomy. Remember those words. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity, and that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. You, you could say that same thing here. Yahweh Elohim speaks in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, a good command. And the man in a beautiful garden, he's not in a desert, who has everything he needs in abundance, he's not starving, with the splendor of creation surrounding him, now has the word of God that's profitable and sure and good and leads to life and leads to joy for his soul and leads to him glorifying God. That good command is pointing the way to life like the trees of the garden are offering him life for his physical body. This, this is a command that's life-giving. It's a, it ought to be a delight to walk in this path, Psalm 119, verse 16. He, he ought to treasure this command in his heart so as not to sin against God, Psalm 119, verse 11. It ought to be a cause of rejoicing for him in the testimonies of Yahweh Elohim, Psalm 119, verse 14. Martin Luther likened that command in this tree to, quote, Adam's church, altar, and pulpit. He said here he was to yield to God the obedience he owed, give recognition to the word and will of God, give thanks to God, and call upon God for aid against temptation. Verse 16 and 17 is showing you that God's word is good because it's best and it brings life and it leads to life. And it's showing you that disobedience to the word brings death. Where has Genesis 2 brought us? It's brought us into a garden, and everything man needs is there. Now, look around you this morning. You know you're not in that garden. Something has happened between Genesis 2 and October 2024 because we no longer live in that place, and we read stories about places like that, and our hearts long to be there. What happened? I think Romans 5.12 sums it up. Sin came into the world through the one man. You know Genesis 3 is coming. Would you look at your outline there again? Genesis 2 took us into the garden. There's a personal God, a relational God. Man's going to be expelled in Genesis 3 from the garden, and it will be reflective of man's relationship with this relational God. Yahweh Elohim is going to send him out of the garden. The relationship is going to be broken. The truth about him is going to be clear that we've been looking towards. He doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. Thorns and thistles and shrubs are going to grow, and man will sweat as he labors in the field to eat. No longer is he going to walk in the lavish garden with an abundance of food. He's going to be expelled and cast out. Number two, living man. Man is going to want to be like Yahweh Elohim, forgetting that he was made from the dust, and Yahweh Elohim is going to render judgment, letting him know that he has brought death into the world, and as a result of that, to death, to dust, the man is going to return, Genesis 3.19. A spiritual death is going to precede a physical death. Number three, lavish garden. 
After Genesis 2 gave us life in the garden, the verses, chapters, the books that follow Genesis 3 are going to show you life outside of the garden that you've become very familiar with. And the word to describe it is not so much beautiful as it's going to be brutal. Image bearers killing one another, even brother killing brother, already in Genesis chapter 4. But there are going to be glimmers of the garden. Some of the elements that are described there in that region around Eden are going to show up in the way that the Lord instructs Moses to build the tabernacle and what the priests are going to wear. And there's going to be this sense as you go to the tabernacle, oh, man may be able to dwell with God again in this place. Number four, good command. What has happened between then and now is that man has rejected what God said that was good and that was life-giving. When man longs for what we find in Genesis 2 that has been lost, and it longs for not only a beautiful garden, but it longs for that relationship with the God who is there. Where is that found? How do I get there? Friend, look to Genesis 2. Look to that outline that you have that showed up all the way back in Genesis 2 of a relational God. God is going to take on flesh. He's going to dwell amongst man. He's going to remain sinless outside of that garden in the wilderness. Living man. The God who can form dust into man and breathe life in him. We're going to be told in Ezekiel he can make dry bones to live. And then through Jesus, you're going to see and the hope is going to be announced that it's not impossible for him to take decaying flesh and to cause it to live again and not only to be resurrected to life, but to be resurrected to glorified life. How? 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Relational God, living man, lavish garden. Jesus is going to be tempted in a garden. He's going to be buried in a garden. He's going to be raised in a garden. And friend, we're going to be reminded that if Yahweh Elohim created a real garden in a real place for a real man in Genesis chapter 2, then he can make such a place again. And Revelation is going to point you there because by the time you get to Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2, oh, guess what? There is a river that is there. And you get to verse 2 and verse 14 and verse 19 in the midst of that place where God's people will dwell with him where there's no more sin, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more death, there's going to be a tree of life there. It's a real place. Relational God, living man, lavish garden, good command. The Word of God is going to become flesh. The Word of God is going to keep every command. And we're going to have the same response that was called for from Adam, believe. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Do you believe that he died on the cross? Do you believe that he takes away your sin? Do you believe that righteousness is found in him? Do you believe that he is the way in which you come to this place that your heart is longing for to be reconciled to your God? We are creatures who rightly long for the splendor of Genesis 2, and we are not there yet. And as a church, we look around and we call ourselves by the words of Scripture, aliens, foreigners, ambassadors, citizens of heaven. We haven't been called home yet, but we know that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is our way to be in that place, and we know that that day is ahead of us, and this is desirable, and it's beautiful because Christ, our Savior, is there. Father, you are so kind and merciful and gracious, and you've showed us that again this morning. To echo the psalmist, how majestic is your name in all the earth. To echo the psalmist, you have displayed your splendor in the earth, the heavens. And we will add this morning the garden. Cause us to treasure your word in our heart. Cause us to delight in your commands. Cause us to see them as good. To see them directing us away from death and to directing us to life. Cause us to see them displaying your mercy that you've revealed them and given them to us. Thank you for giving us Genesis 2. Thank you for forming man from dust and showing us that truth and breathing life into him. May it reinforce our hope in the resurrection that you can take our bodies that have become dust and those that we have loved that have become dust 
and you can form them into glorified bodies. And thank you that before that day and that time, that in this very day and moment in which we live, you give us spiritual life now that's found in your Son. Until each of the citizens of heaven return home, until the ambassadors are called back, until we are once again with our God in the place with no sin and no death, until then, Father, may our hearts be comforted knowing that we are already today united to Christ now. The Spirit lives in us now, and we have confidence to enter the holy place now by the blood of Christ. So today, as Hebrews reminds us, we can draw near to a place where our hearts long to be. Help us to continually know as we are continually tempted otherwise. Help us to continually know that the longing of our hearts and the fulfilling of our purpose is found in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in His name we pray. Amen.